When Canadian Lieutenant General Romeo Dallaire commanded United Nations forces during the Rwandan genocide, few beyond the military were aware of the severe psychological damage that witnessing such moral atrocities can cause. Dallaire's revelation that he suffered from PTSD and moral injury in the Rwandan conflict helped destigmatize these potentially devastating mental conditions among military veterans. It also helped us understand how all of us can experience moral injury in our daily lives. As we live through the aftershocks of a global pandemic, racial injustice, and the rise of extremist violence around the world, there's no better time to have a conversation about trauma, recovery, and moral courage. How do we build resilience, collective hope? How can we embrace humanity and human connection? Join the conversation as we work together to build upon General Dallaire's call for transformative change and an engaged approach to leadership in the face of moral dilemmas. Welcome, everyone. My name is Dr. Eric Vermetten. I'm a psychiatrist and a professor at Leiden University in the Netherlands and an officer in the Dutch Armed Forces. I'm joined by my co-hosts, Dr. Suzette Bermo Phillips, an occupational therapist and associate professor at the University of Alberta, and Dr. Shelley Whitman, executive director of the Dallaire Institute for Children, Peace, and security. It is my great pleasure to welcome you to this first of the Clevering Hut Dallaire critical conversation sessions. We are so excited that people have joined us from all over the world and walks of life. Alumni of our universities, educators, students, military officers, first responders, researchers, and lawmakers, and, and many others. We're so glad that you have joined us for today's webinar, Moral Leadership and Courage from Different Perspectives. Now, we have 46 different countries represented in the viewers, coming from Canada, the Netherlands, but also from countries like Rwanda, Kenya, Democratic, Democratic Republic of Congo, Liberia, Nigeria, Brazil, Cameroon, Sierra Leone, Somalia, Cape Verde, Afghanistan, Iraq, China, Japan, and many more. This series is in honor of the Clairvigat Chair that was awarded to General Romeo Dallaire in November 2020. Born in the Netherlands, General Dallaire is a celebrated Canadian who has exemplified moral courage, the key focus of the Clairvigat Professorship. In one of our research partnership meetings, Eric and I spoke about ways to highlight General Dallaire's messages about moral courage and leadership through a critical conversation series. We had the privilege of engaging General Dallaire and esteemed colleagues from around the world, inviting them to reflect with us on issues related to complex, ambiguous moral and ethical dilemmas in these times, times overshadowed by issues associated with the global pandemic, climate change, racialization, and threats of terror and a call for reconciliation and transformative culture change. More than ever, we need engaged leaders who can inspire and actualize transformative culture change in these days. This series aims to provide a context for such conversations. Eric? But before we start, some things to note. Uh, General Dallaire's experience is a threat that weaves these sessions all together. The conversations will often go back to the themes of his experience. And we're excited that General Dallaire is part of the panel today and will be participating in each of the eight sessions through the last session on November 10 in the honor of Remembrance Day. So each session is about 90 minutes long. You registered and you received a live stream link for this specific session. Now, if you wish to follow all of the conversations, you will need to register for each separate event. And please share the event with your colleagues, with your friends, and post them on social media if you like. 
We'd also love to hear your questions and comments. Please let us know what you think. You can share your thoughts for today's session um, using the question box directly below the video player. We will do our best to answer questions that are posted as we're able. Finally, the sessions will be recorded and made available immediately following the event right here on this event page. Now I'd like now to give the two presidents of the universities holding these webinar series the, the word. First, uh, we invite Dr. Hester Bell, the Rector Magnificus of Leiden University, and then Bill Flanagan, president of the University of Alberta. We are delighted that they took time to address uh, these conversations. Uh, dear Hester, may I give you the word first? Sure. Thank you very much, Eric. Well, welcome to you all. As Rector Magnificus of Leiden University, I'm very happy, happy and honored to open this event, the Cleveringa Dallaire Critical Conversation Series. As you may have heard, this event has been initiated by Leiden University in collaboration with Heroes in Mind Advocacy and Research Consortium led by the Faculty of Rehabilitation Medicine at the University of Alberta and the Dallaire Institute of Dalhousie, Canada, to leverage the Cleveringa Professorship awarded to retired general, now Professor Romeo Dallaire. Who was Cleveringa and what is the Cleveringa Professorship? Well, Rudolf Cleveringa was a full professor at Leiden University. In 1940, he denounced the invading Germans' removal of all Jewish professors from the university. Cleveringa was arrested and imprisoned by the security services, and Leiden University was closed down by the occupying forces. The Cleveringa chair, which is installed to recognize a recipient's moral courage for taking action against resistance, is held by a different person each academic year. The holder can be Dutch or international. And this rotating Cleveringa professorship in existence since 1970 was awarded on November 26, 2020 to retired General Romeo Dallaire. Romeo Dallaire was the commander of the United Nations Relief Mission in Rwanda during the 1994 genocide. He was ordered by the UN to withdraw, but ignored this order and continued to protect those seeking help. While General Dallaire was not imprisoned by external forces, he was imprisoned within himself and crippled by post-traumatic stress disorder, PTSD and moral injury. His acknowledgement of these struggles made this potential deadly condition a topic of discussion among veterans. General Romeo Dallaire continued on a path to recovery, self-forgiveness, and reached out to the United Nations and world leaders. He has also led by example through his service, including during the Rwandan genocide, through the Dallaire Institute, and his continued investment in future leaders. The Cleveringa Dallaire Critical Conversation Series, made possible with support from the Leiden Naples Tans PTSD Fund, has been put together by Eric Vermette and Suzette Brumeau Phillips, whom you just met, following the themes that General Romeo Dallaire addressed in his 2020 Cleveringa lecture. Are all humans human? Ethical responsibility in a new world disorder. It addresses questions such as, how do leaders sustain moral codes in times of adversar adversarity? Adversity, sorry. How do they cope with the impact of war on the battlefield, in UN leadership, in criminal courts and at home? And how do leaders recover from moral injury? The title of Dallaire's presentation subsequently challenged Leiden University to a call to action. This critical conversation series is a response to that call. Dallaire aims to inspire and empower a new generation that is without borders a generation whose combined leadership, vision, and grasp of technology is poised to create incredible and immediate change in the world. Leiden University, as a university without borders, aims to support this new generation of leaders by emboldening them to engage in critical conversations around topics 
of global significance. At the heart of these discussions lies Dallaire's vision of embracing all humanity, fostering engaged leadership and facilitating transformative cultural change. So between September 2022 20, and November 10, Leiden and international experts will discuss topics raised by Dallaire in more detail and engage in conversations moderated by esteemed colleagues. They will also be informed by General Dallaire's engagement with students in anticipation of the series. One student commented, this is really beautiful, this student session with General Dallaire embodied what it means to be human. We experienced a passion-filled moment backdropped with the impact of adversity and the power of human resilience. Peace can only be sustained through the cultivation of morality and justice. And this was our call to action. Huda al Shamali said. This is a unique event. Over 1,500 registrations were counted a week ago. And as I reviewed the program, I recognized panels of experts in PTSD, children's rights, war crimes, humanitarian law, and peacekeeping. This is a true interdisciplinary representation of academic excellence, all with the aim of raising awareness of issues surrounding humanity, engaged leadership, justice, moral injury, and moral courage. I extend to you a warm welcome and hope that you may experience many inspiring moments throughout this Clevering Gadaler critical conversation series. Moments that will carry forward the charge to truly make a difference. Dr. Bill Flanagan, president of the University of Alberta, would we be able to ask you to say a few words of welcome from, from this corner of Alberta? Wonderful. Well, thank you for that introduction, and I'm really delighted to join in today's event. And first, I just want to say I join you from Treaty 6 territory, and this is a traditional gathering place for diverse Indigenous peoples in Canada. And the University of Alberta acknowledges their histories, languages, and cultures, and continue to play an important role in our vibrant community. And thank you, Colonel Bermetton and Dr. Bremo Philippe, for hosting today's event. And greetings to Rector Magnificus Hester Beale of Leiden University. And on behalf of the University of Alberta, I'm delighted to welcome today's distinguished guests and each one a courageous leader. A retired Lieutenant Governor, the Honorable Dr. Romeo Dallaire, retired Major General Patrick uh, Camarti, and Michelle uh, Chikwanine. Throughout their careers, they have each faced tremendous adversity and confronting it by leading with compassion, truth, and resolve. We can learn so much from their experiences, and I look forward to hearing from each of them today. And the University of Alberta is honored to partner with the Universities of Leiden and Dalhousie to bring this Clever Cleveringa Dallaire critical conversation. And today, the global community is faced with numerous shared challenges. Challenges like COVID-19, rising polar polarization and inequality, climate change, political conflict, and mental health crises. These are complex issues that require coordinated international responses. Public universities the world over are sharing knowledge and research that can help us understand the forces that are at play. But through collaborative projects, we can create innovations, social, economic, medical, and technological, that will address the roots of these problems. And the free exchange of ideas is a critical part of that process. And forums like the Cleveland Ringa Dallaire Critical Conversation Series allow us to bring together leaders of wisdom and vision to help us make sense of the world and its challenges, to bring forward solutions. Universities inspire the human spirit and lift up society. Through teaching and learning, research and academic inquiry, community involvement and partnerships. Through international collaborations like this, we learn from the remarkable minds and lived experiences of people like today's panelists. At the University of Alberta, we're very fortunate to have Romeo Dallaire so actively engaged with the Heroes in Mind Advocacy and Research Consortium and our broader community. 
He's been a guest speaker at many events at the university. In 2016, he received an honorary doctor of laws from the University of Alberta. And upon receiving his degree, Romeo Dallaire called the graduating students before him, the generation without borders. He said that their grasp of technology had allowed them to communicate with the world at incredible speed and given them the means to create immediate change. Great ideas can indeed change the world, but great ideas sometimes need a push forward to turn them into reality. Our universities must be places where ideas and discoveries are not only pursued, but are also transformed into social and technological innovations. We must continue to cultivate curiosity, creative inquiry, and collaboration. So great changes start with great ideas, which is why today's conversation is so important. So on behalf of the University of Alberta, welcome everyone. Thank you. Thank you both for your thoughtful remarks, both um, Dr. Bale and also Dr. Flanagan. It's a, it's a privilege to hear your thoughtful comments and support for the series and a privilege to collaborate um, as we go forward. Eric. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Bile. Thank you, Hester, dear Hester, and, and thank you, Bill, for these wonderful introductions. And now for a, a few words of welcome um, from the executive director of the Delaire Institute uh, for Children, Peace and Security, Dr. Shelley Whitman, who will also introduce General uh, Romy Delaire. Shelley, please. Thank you very much, Eric, and to Suzette. Uh, thank you as well to uh, Dr. Bill Flanagan in the University of Alberta, and also to Professor Dr. Hester Bill from uh, University of Leiden. Thank you for being able to be here with us, all of you who have joined us from all over the globe, and for joining the Cleveringa Delaire conversation series today. I will be your moderator for today, and I certainly hope that it leads into a series of conversations over the coming months that will keep you engaged and inspired. Today, I would like to also acknowledge that as part of Dalhousie University, the Dallaire Institute for Children, Peace and Security acknowledges that we are on the unceded territory of the Mi'kmaq people. This coming month, Canada has marked September 30th as Truth and Reconciliation Day. And this is critical to understanding how we build a world where we create one that is fit for children to achieve peace and security around the world. I am honored to be here among such esteemed colleagues and Dalhousie University is also pleased to be part of this particular exchange as we focus on things such as building open dialogue on key international issues. Dalhousie University is the home of the Dallaire Institute for Children, Peace and Security and our mission at the Dallaire Institute is to prevent the recruitment and use of children in armed violence. In doing so, we take what we believe is research that is put into action around the globe. The inspiration that we all uh, have, our founder, General Romeo Dallaire, who is here with us today, I have the honor of introducing him to all of you who are present. I know that many words have been said already to uh, introduce you to him. And I know he is someone who needs no introduction. I am pleased uh, to have my mentor, my friend and colleague with us today. General Delaire, the floor is yours. Thank you, Shelley, very much and very kind words as well. Thank you so much for being with us today to moderate this opening session, Shelley. And to the, uh, Dr. Mange, to Dr. Flanagan, thank you very much, both of you, for being present and taking the time uh, to say such magnificent, encouraging words, uh, and also to help my ego, which is already under enormous duress, uh, to be restrained. So, well done to you. Uh, I am also absolutely overjoyed at a fellow fellow commander and field officer and, and, and a magnificent exemplary peacekeeper with innovative approaches and, and commitment, um, particularly to the protection of women and girls, uh, and that is General uh, Patrick Kimmerer. He uh, was uh, very close to me uh, during the 
post-Rwandan scenarios, and I am very proud that he is here today to speak and to give us his insights. Michel Shikoeni is also a, a very close friend. He's been a child soldier. He's been with us at the, the Lair Institute for Children, Peace and Security. He's written, uh, he's studied, uh, and he has spoken ex extensively on the abuse and use in this modern martyrdom of children uh, in conflicts. And so uh, to Eric and to Suzette, uh, well done in getting this thing launched. And I am confident that you will have the energy to sustain it for the next couple months. Uh, and also to extract uh, the extraordinary debate and discussions and innovative ideas that I'm sure will come out of it. I, I am, uh, I'm in a, a rather interesting position as, as a person who, yes, uh, has this recognition, but only in as much as uh, I am sitting here representing thousands upon thousands upon thousands of veterans of all the troop contributing nations and their commanders and their troops who have been committed to more and more complex and ambiguous missions uh, around the world, which put them into extraordinary ethical and moral, yes, and even legal dilemmas as they try to apply these mandates that often well, it's often are not uh, at the summit of what uh, we would need as direction nor resources to be able to achieve our mission. With that in mind, the, we the suffer and we do uh, to varying degrees are affected by these decisions uh, that are then been and assessed originally as operational stress injuries or PTSD, but only after a while have we realized uh, that there is a much deeper, deeper injury that has attacked our moral fiber, has attacked every reference that we have uh, in our ways of life, in our education, our background, our communities. And that assault has left us, because of decisions we've had to take under sudden, such conditions, in some very uh, difficult ways of readjusting to what might be considered the normalcy of life. And so I uh, have been able to work uh, with Dr. Whitman uh, in moving at least one, one area that has been a horrible source uh, of such injuries. And that is uh, when we have to face uh, children who are used in front lines and in all different uh, endeavors in conflicts by state and non-state actors. How, how can a soldier face his children after having had to take uh, the decision to use lethal force against ultimately a child? How do you adjust uh, to that reference and, and to whom can you even speak of it? And that has uh, had enormous impacts on so many of us. So this session uh, is an opening session uh, that I hope doesn't necessarily just open wounds, but in fact, uh, provide an opportunity for people to speak. And I am very proud that uh, the moral injury dimension has been taken up extensively by the research team at uh, the Dallaire Institute for Peace and Security, and even our veterans uh, department uh, in the Canadian government has invested uh, substantive funds for the next five years to pursue that research so that we reduce the level of casualties on the children, yes, but on our soldiers who commit themselves to these missions. And so with those much too long uh, statement, I am only too happy to hand over to you, Shelley, for the moderate us and to listen to the words of an old friend and a very, very fine comrade. Patrick, so Shelly Evu. Merci. Thank you very much, sir. So as we uh, get into the portion of today's session, I wanted to just give a few uh, opening remarks uh, about the items that we will discuss. 
as well as an understanding to further uh, your remarks, sir, about the connections between uh, the various pieces of work that we have been conducting. For those who are listening, uh, those of you who may not know the work of the Dallaire Institute for Children, Peace and Security, for over 10 years, we have advanced a mission to prevent the recruitment and use of children in armed violence. And this mission has been conducted through policy change, prevention oriented security sector training that aims to change attitudes and behaviors and is transformative in its approach and is grounded in research that addresses the gaps in knowledge and best practices. These elements all come together when we discuss moral injury. Through what we have coined as our children's rights upfront approach, we seek to elevate children's well being as essential to achieving international peace and security. At the same time, we recognize the need for understanding the security sector perspectives, those people who are behind the uniforms, and the moral dilemmas that they are faced with regularly in conflict zones around the world. In 2017, the Dallaire Institute collaborated with the Government of Canada to co-create the Vancouver Principles on Peacekeeping and the Prevention of the Recruitment and Use of Child Soldiers. To date, we have 104 nations that have endorsed. The Vancouver Principles are motivated by the conviction that preventing the recruitment and use of children as soldiers is not a peripheral issue to UN peacekeeping, but is critical to achieving overall mission success and setting the conditions for lasting peace and security. One of the principles focuses on mental health and it promotes research on the trauma experienced by personnel interacting with children in armed conflict. As General Dallaire has stated, we are very pleased that the Canadian government through Veterans Affairs Canada has recently announced and awarded us, along with the Centre for Addictions and Mental Health here in Canada, a five-year grant to look into this very issue. Today, I am pleased to have three panelists each with first-hand experience on many of these issues. We have as our founder, General Romeo Dallaire, Next, we have Major General Patrick Kamert of the Netherlands. He was a distinguished um, military uh, career serviceman who served as the UN Force Commander in Ethiopia and Eritrea. As military advisor to the Department of UN Peacekeeping Operations and as General Officer Commanding the Eastern Division of Monuk in the Democratic Republic of the Congo. General Kamert has also served as an International Advisory Council member of the Dallaire Institute and is a leading champion on international peace and security, peacekeeping reform, the protection of civilians, and a focus on ending sexual violence in conflict. In addition, we have another distinguished colleague with us, Michelle Shikwanine, who was born in the Democratic of Republic of Congo. He experienced the challenges of being a child in a conflict zone when at the age of five, he was abducted by an armed group. He escaped and eventually made his way to Canada. Michelle is now an international peace advocate, an author, a UN fellow for people of African descent, and also an international advisory council member of the Dallaire Institute. I want to give you all a warm welcome and we will kick off our first round of this discussion today with remarks from each of our presenters. But I would like to begin with uh, General Patrick Kamert. General Kamert, thank you for joining us all the way from Bamako. <laughs> and uh, please, we would like to give you the floor for your opening remarks on moral courage and leadership. Thank you, Shelley. Thank you very much. And thank you, Romeo, for your kind words. And thank you for inviting me to speak at the opening session of the lecture series hosted by Leiden University and the Dallaire Institute at Dalhousie University on moral leadership. In the next 10 minutes or so, I will be speaking as a practitioner, not as an academic, as someone with 39 years in military uniform and having had the privilege of leading people, civilian and military, in several operations, in particular in UN missions in sometimes very difficult 
and risky circumstances. I learned by falling down and standing up, by looking at the successes and failures of others, and above all, to listen to others. One develops values and ethics over time and with gaining experience during a career and as such shaping one's thoughts and views. One is already privileged if parents have raised you in a stable environment, giving you a daily dose of the right values, ethics and norms. These include integrity, respect, accountability, community, fairness, honesty, caring for others and duty. Over the years, I realized how much of these values I learned from my father, who was a police officer. Think when you're leading people about the principles by which you live your life. Moral leadership is defined as a leader's behavior that demonstrates superior virtues, self-discipline, and unselfishness. It entails setting an example for others about the rightness or wrongness of particular actions. Moral leadership is providing values or meaning for people to live by, inspiration to act, and motivation to hold oneself accountable. When you don't see someone stepping up to provide purpose and doing what is best for the greater good, you step up. Moral leadership is a responsibility. It is also a power not to be taken for granted. The leader has the power, and in my view, the duty to delegate authority to others. If you have some power, then your job is to empower somebody else. But delegation also means that the leader is still responsible for the decisions others have made. In the military, we use many times the term fog of war, which means the uncertainty in what is going on in military operations, in situational awareness. No communications are possible. Casualties around you, noise, chaos. By the way, it's not only in military operations. An earthquake or humanitarian disaster knows also its fog of war. How can the leader organize this chaos? In peacekeeping, we have also many times a fog of war. So how to deal with this fog of war? In many armed forces, they use the style of command called mission command. A mission command is the conduct of military operations through decentralized execution based on mission type orders, developed by Prussian Field Marshal Helmut von Moltke in the 19th century. Tell your subordinates what to do, when and why, but not how. That authority is delegated. Given the orders, the attentions of commanders two levels up, and von Moltke said those at every level of the organization understand enough of the intentions of the higher command to enable it to achieve its goal. That results in a rapid decision-making and speed of advance. One does not have to ask permission of the boss all the time. Mission command is also embraced in civilian business. I'll give you an example of those orders. Charlie Company must cordon and search the village of Alungu at first light in order to seize weapons and ammunition. The why, when, and what, but not how. But key in a successful use of this style of command of leadership is the acceptance of mistakes made by your subordinates. Praise with a loud voice, reprimand with a soft voice. People feel empowered and if backed and trusted by their superiors, they will repay that trust by performing and hardworking to the best of their abilities. Moral leadership means keeping the overview and not smothering the subordinates in micromanagement. Leaders should care for their people, for their workers. At this very moment, we are witnessing terrible crises in the world. Yemen, Mali, Afghanistan, Libya, Lebanon. We see the need at the highest strategic levels of leadership. Moral leadership, where leaders put the interest of others first instead of themselves or their own country. In times of uncertainty and confusing, misleading messages, there is more than ever a need of leaders that can be trusted, speaking the truth, providing news, even if it is bad news. I think a good example is Prime Minister of New Zealand, Jacinda Ardern, who showed real moral leadership during the COVID crisis. 
There is a need for something that people can hold on to, feel supported, feel that the leader understands their problems. One former CEO described how the work of a leader is to define reality and give hope. Hope, he said, must be matched with an honest assessment of reality, a clear-eyed assessment, leveling with people as to what is really going on and with transparency, integrity, and trust. Leading with people as to what is really going on means for me, for example, not painting a too rosy picture on the security situation in the UN peace mission, or briefing the Security Council, or briefing the President of the United States and NATO leadership by the commanders on the ground about the real situation in Afghanistan. As Mr. Lakda Brahimi said in his report on peacekeeping and the future of the United Nations in peace in 2000, and I quote, brief the Security Council what they need to know, not what they want to hear. I remember my own briefings ahead of the UN mission in Hudayda in Yemen to the Security Council on the situation on the ground, in the city and the province, on the progress of the mediation between the parties involved and the risk we were taking in crossing the front lines. I tried to be as honest and accurate as possible, not raising false expectations, but telling the members of the Security Council what was needed from them to help me to implement the Hudeida Agreement of Stockholm. Ladies and gentlemen, moral leadership is so needed when, for example, female military personnel are sexually assaulted by their fellow officers and non-commissioned officers' colleagues, in particular when deployed on an operation. Complaints are so many times mishandled by the superiors of the victims. Sometimes even the highest political and military leaders are lacking moral leadership to address this issue properly. Again, the word trust comes back. In my view, key in leadership, in moral leadership, people are unable to trust those who frequently lie or omit the facts. This trust, this confidence, this loyalty, this devotion must be true, must be shown. It's not just a matter of nice words and unbreakable promises. It means to be there if someone counts on you, not fleeing when the situation gets tense, not walking away when it seems that maybe something better can be obtained somewhere else, not letting people down if it seems that the purpose is missing. It is not without effort. It's not self-evident. It's not out of necessity. It's not something because there is no other choice. This trust this confidence, this loyalty must be done, must be acquired. It must be defined again and again. In the military profession, a lot of actions are about life and death. There must be an unbreakable trust what, that whilst on patrol, that during military operation, that the persons in front or behind you are there when it is needed. That one can trust the organization that no one will be left behind on the battlefield. That when wounded, you are taken care of that you trust your comrades, that they will be there for you, that your superiors can be trusted. Moral leadership and also the lack of it was shown in difficult circumstances during the crisis in Kabul, where the diplomatic staff of a country left the embassy in the middle of the night for the relative safety of the airport, leaving the local staff alone in bewilderment looking after the embassy. On board of a ship, it is the captain who is the last one to leave the sinking ship. When waiting in line for food at the cafeteria, the officers eat last. A very good example of showing real moral leadership is General Romeo Dallaire during his tenure as first commander due to the Rwanda crisis. Abandoned at so many levels by so many, and left to his own moral compass, how to manage the fog of war, the terrible violent chaos around him. He can look himself in the mirror and say, I tried to the best of my ability. So many others cannot say the same. I'd like to finish with a quote for former head of the Department of Peacekeeping Operations under Secretary General Jean-Marie Guéhenot. And he said, in peacekeeping, you have a dilemma to look the other way and have to live the rest of your life with maybe the notion that if you had moved in, you may have made a difference. 
or to move in, it may be with the risk of failure. Thank you. Thank you very much. Very profound remarks, um, General Kamerat. Really wonderful way to start this session today. There are so many wonderful things you've stated and now I would like to turn it over to our other panelists, Michelle Shikonine. Michelle, if you could begin with some opening remarks on moral courage and leadership. Wow, I don't, first of all, I don't even know how I follow up on that. <laughs> Um, General Patrick, thank you so much for, for the, what you just said. I am genuinely humbled uh, by this opportunity to share this platform with such distinguished panelists. And, and I'm sure the stories and, and the lessons that you're going to be talking, not just throughout this panel, but throughout the months ahead for this conversation are in important and absolutely necessary in the current climate of our society. To me, moral courage and leadership means that uncommon capacity to take uh, personal responsibility for hard and sometimes terrifying decisions when one is presented with challenges, something that I think General Patrick just, just said so perfectly well. But it also, to me, means having the humility to be open in letting those principles and values grow with experience. Sadly, this is this is such an uncommon, uncommon leadership trait. This is exemplified by one of the most shameful incidents in, in our human history. In the book, Ordinary Men, which is about SS murder squads in Eastern Poland, uh, Christopher Browning noted that only a relative small number of those murder squads liked what they were doing. The vast majority hated it intensely, but they were prepared to go along with the murder of women, children, and old people because they felt that they were compelled to do so by group loyalty and a belief in the legit legitimacy of their orders. Only a very relative few refused to participate in the massacres. Yesterday, I was at a store and I had a conversation with a man, a Canadian man after our Canadian elections, and he claimed that the Liberal Party winning means the moral decay of Canadian society and that the Conservative Party and Conservatives are the only morally righteous party that we have in Canada. Now, regardless of your politics, pre-war politics in Germany was no indicator or no predicator of who would be in the small percentage of people who would not participate in ma massacres if they were compelled by group loyalty and belief in the legitimacy of laws. German Social Democrats, Communists, all of them participate, participated alongside social Christian Democrats and Nazis. In fact, some Nazis, most famously Oskar Schindler, were heroic in their rescue efforts during the Second World War. As the Canadian man kept talking yesterday, I remember the chilling observation that Christopher Browning made in his book, which was that anybody who looks back at that period and says that they would not have participated in the massacres had they been in the same circumstance is simply delusional. I wondered what that man at that store would have said had I presented him with the same thought. While I somewhat sympathize with Browning's observation, I don't agree with it entirely, primarily because of my father. Whenever I look at an example for moral leadership and courage, I think of my father's work as a human rights activist during the Mobutu years in what was then Zaire and now in the Democratic Republic of Congo and especially during the first Congo War in 1998. During that period, my father would document the callous raping of women, men, and children, the looting of people's properties, and most importantly, he would expose the corrupt nature of that war, linking high-ranking officials in the area with multinational companies or foreign governments with a massacre of villages for access to mineral-rich areas. My father was showing courage in the face of such insurmountable odds. He refused to be bribed and to stay silent. He refused to conform to the standards of many Congolese politicians and instead chose to do what he believes was righteous for his community. Not out of a God complex, but as he told me once, because he loved his country. Moral courage led to him being able to save the lives of many civilians in my town of Beni, where I was born. My father was also a Christian man, and I know he consciously thought, to him, consciously thought to himself and reflected upon the idea of what it means to be a Christian man in such a political climate. 
what was acceptable and what was unacceptable. And like my Canadian friend at the store yesterday, I don't believe that moral courage is predicated by a religion, your atheism, or your political leaning. Moral courage in leadership to me means taking ownership of your beliefs and values. Now, most of us will never face leadership or moral challenges such as my father or General Romeo Dallaire or the Germans during World War II or many of the challenging moments that have happened in world history. Yet we are faced with our own leadership and moral challenges of dealing with some of the biggest issues challenging our humanity. Climate change, extreme income inequality, corruption in politics, specifically the issue of money in politics or legalized bribery, and an issue that both General Delaire and I share profoundly, the use of children in armed conflicts. Yet despite all of this, I think of my father and the last thing he said to me, great men and great women throughout history have never been praised for their money nor their success, but rather by their heart and what they do for others. My father was an ordinary man, yet he did great things because he loved people and he loved his country. I'm here as a testament to how great relationships can build great communities. Moral and courageous leadership should always strive to build great leadership. Thank you. Thank you very much, Michelle. Really wonderful remarks and your perspective is so important. Thank you for that. I think that you have both done a remarkable uh, job to now turn over to General Dallaire for his opening remarks on moral courage and leadership. General Dallaire. Thank you very much, Shelley, and, and a, a, a super well done to both you, Patrick and Michelle, in what you've described as the realities on the ground uh, of having to face uh, ethical and moral and legal dilemmas that push uh, every fiber of your being uh, to an extreme and in the end leave you often with the nagging scenario of was that the right answer? Did I give the right answer? Was the, uh, the decision uh, appropriate for the moment? Uh, some of us have lived these experiences and have been tested by it. And others, many others have not and probably never will be fully tested in their life. But if it comes, it may come as an enormous surprise to you at how you do respond. And I would like to uh, indicate to you that uh, it's not necessarily in the case of my background of my military training and tactics and all how to handle these pure situations. Uh, it, it doesn't come from uh, the operational directives that you get or even from the mandate that, you, that you've that you received. Uh, it, it comes and appears as an instinctive reaction, a, a reaction that is based on what is what you are, what is the inner you? What guides you? And that guidance is not necessarily taken as an articulation of a whole series of qualities and, and capabilities and so on, which you run through as a checklist and then decide. It comes, in fact, so surprisingly as a very instinctive reaction that ultimately you will live with, yes, but that you do reassess afterwards and you say, well, why did I decide that? How did, it, how did that come about? And only to, to be able to dissect it and go back to, to, to your family life, and go back to the schools and, and, and the institutions of your community, and go back to, in fact, uh, the education background that you've been able to work, your experiences of work, life, and so on, and with other peoples your growing list of capabilities and how you've been handling these experiences of life. And you start to see that it's the composite of this background that actually creates the spontaneous reaction that in the end you are at ease with, although there is always the nagging decision 
uh, as to whether or not it's fully responded to the need. You know, when they were, when people were being slaughtered in Rwanda and they were calling for help and I had very few soldiers and they had been already allotted, we moved them to security points as best we, I could. And at the end of the phone, uh, the, you know, the, they, the woman would be calling and crying and screaming and saying, send me some soldiers to protect us because they're at the door. They're going to kill us. And, and, I, and I had to tell her that I had already allotted people to other tasks. I had nobody left. It was sort of like a decision on who will live and who will die. And that in itself was a demanding way of having to handle the situation and analyzing. But then when you could hear the door being broken down, you could hear the machetes hitting and killing the screaming and the phone just dangling there and those sounds. That, that's when the shock of having to take such decisions will hit you. And ultimately, it's the culmination of so many of such scenarios that start to eat away at you in your ability to sustain it. And in the end, uh, I became overcome by so much of this and felt that the demands on what you can provide do have at times a limit. And recognizing that, and recognizing that you need support, recognizing that you need help, that you can in fact seek peer support and, and therapeutic support to live in a reasonable way with those decisions and ultimately still be able to thrive. That, that is a gift uh, uh, that I hope more will be able to receive to get that support and to be supported in that, not only in the technical ways, but supported by their families, by their communities, uh, and ultimately by uh, their government and by the resources that can be made available to them. So there is still so much to be learned on how to attenuate the impact of these decisions, how they will not affect you to the extent that you become, in fact, uh, non-operative, but more importantly, how we can avoid that such injuries ultimately, ultimately can be fatal. That is critical because it's one thing to be in theaters of operations in conducting these, these tasks. But when you're home and the war is over and the task is over, year for you too often, that war still goes on, that task is still alive and how you're able to sustain the pressure of that for years after and attenuate it and live with it is a demand that we are seeking from the research that's gone going to be able to master and to give us a, a way of living with it and ultimately regaining hope for life and maybe instilling some of it in others. So that to me uh, is a mandate that I've given myself and that I feel and that I am, I am personally overjoyed that how uh, the work on trying to reduce the possibilities of such uh, scenarios, like having to face child soldiers and having to take life and death decisions with, with, with children and so on, that we're working not only at trying to reduce those scenarios and give, give uh, answers and capabilities uh, to uh, soldiers and policemen uh, in order to meet those requirements, but also that we are researching in order to attenuate the impact that this may have on those that serve and ultimately on their families for the rest of their lives. So thank you for letting me go on and I'm looking forward to the discussion. Thank you very much, General Dallaire. And thank you to all three for the opening comments. In this next portion, I would like to now have an opportunity to engage each of you. 
I wanted to uh, start out with a question from some of the remarks that I have been observing, which I think um, have some resonance across each of your remarks. But I also want to say to you, uh, all three of you, should you have questions or remarks you would like to interject with to one of the other panelists, I am also very happy for you to do so. I wanted to pick up on a point that uh, General Kamert had stated about purpose and how when you don't see someone else stepping up to provide it, you may very well be the one who should step up to provide it. And I was thinking about the remarks from Michelle, Michelle in particular about the inspiration from your father who was a great leader and how both yourself, General Kamert, have the connection to the Democratic Republic of Congo in a different way, and General Dallaire equally in terms of uh, being there in Rwanda and having seen the refugee crisis in the eastern uh, portion of the DRC. I am wondering about how we think on purpose in this time of flux uh, that we have in the world right now. Many are really struggling to understand their purpose. And I do believe that in terms of moral courage, that this is something that is going to profoundly impact us, especially uh, in a post COVID-19 world that we are coping with. So thinking on purpose and transformative culture changes, how can we try to address uh, a renewed sense of purpose, especially in light of the conflicts that are going on around the world. And um, I'd like to start, maybe if I can pose that question to you, Michelle, firstly. Uh, thank you. Um, I think for me, one of the, the biggest challenges that I've always faced on, for me, especially trying to figure out what my purpose was in life was always going back to who are the people that inspired me the most and what values did they instill to me, which is why I always bring up my father because that's mostly where my moral campus is always pointed to. Uh, he was a great person and a great man in that sense. And so for me, I look at the world and the, the leadership that we tend to lionize or the people that we tend to celebrate and most of the time that we, we visually tend to see in, in that time, in, in this time of crisis and flux, as you said, and they don't tend to represent the best of us. And I think especially for young people, uh, in the early 2000s, there was a group of young people in, in the Philippines who created a virus called the love bug virus. Uh, some people can remember it. But anyways, you know, most people were questioning, like, what's the purpose of young people today with technology and all these things? And I don't think young people today are any different from any youth of the past. The only really difference here is that with the epoch of technology, we have a path to either take our, our young people to a path where they lead the worst of us in humanity or they lead us to the best of who we are. And I think in many ways that, that starts at who are the people that we present to them as inspiration, as people they look up to, uh, to our society? Do we present the, the business leaders who are above all just want money and that's it? Or do we present them with the worst of humankind, people who could care less about um, what happens on the other side of the world? Uh, and so for me, it really starts with, with the people that we present as representative of our values, people that we inspire, especially for a younger generation that are going to deal with some of the issues that I detailed on, on, the, on the back end of my, of my uh, remarks. Thank you, Michelle, the wonderful remarks. And I'm completely with you that I think that uh, there's still so much to be inspired by, yet we seem to focus so much on the negativity of, of, of those elements. General Kamert, um, your thoughts, um, maybe building off of what Michelle has said and, and thinking about your uh, experience in places like the Democratic Republic of Congo. Thank you, Michelle. Uh, and thank you, uh, Shelly, for um, the question you gave me the floor. I think that, that the series of lectures like we have now here, the advocacy and the audience that is being created by so many people are listening to this, you know, is something uh, which is, I think, very, very important to paint the picture of what is going on other than the TikTok and, the, and, and whatever little games are there. Just to make sure that people understand that 
a lot of other people are in deep, deep trouble and in deep need. I had the, 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 the privilege of, the, of serving in Yemen as well. These are big humanitarian crisis in the world. As we speak, you hardly see anything in the papers anymore because it fades away. We have to make sure that it stays on the world news and we have to advocate, bring it to the, beat the drums and make sure that it is also on the, on the, on the desks of our political leaders. In the Congo, you know, I was not, I mean, I think I was prepared, in Yemen, I was, I was prepared for a lot of things, but I was never prepared for the little skeletons that I saw there because of malnutrition. And those eyes of the mother and the child who are looking at you with the message, you are going to help me. And you know you cannot. You can only try to bring the two parties together and be angry with them if they are still, you know, discussing and debating and, and at the same time their own people are dying. In, and in the Congo, I was, I was not prepared for the amount of sexual violence that I saw in the Congo. I, it, was, it took me completely by, by surprise, it knocked me out. And then you see that you must try to, to bring as many people to the forefront to, to do something about it. Don't look away, you know, so many of your colleagues, military colleagues, that because they were not prepared for it, looking away. You have to bring them back, you have to train them, you have to advocate, you have to all the time let them focus on that, that there is more in life than, you know, the, the, the new pair of Nikes and the new, you know, latest uh, iPhone or whatever. And that is a frappe, frappe toujours, right? that is a non-stop message that you have to send. In, and therefore, I'm, I'm so grateful that, that you have this lecture series now and that so many people are listening to it and hopefully spread the message to, to others. Thank you very much, Patrick. Um, absolutely. It can be really tiring to keep banging on the drum and saying the same messages and wondering why nobody is listening. Uh, General Delen knows that both from his time in Rwanda, but... <laughs> Still to this day, uh, General Delaire, maybe if you could say a few words about uh, that dynamic of, you know, transforming culture change and purpose and just building off the comments from Michelle and Patrick. I, thank you for the opportunity, yeah, to, to follow all this up. And I'm, I'm going to uh, bring a, a current scenario uh, uh, and again to the forefront and then bring it back to some previous experience to make my case. Um, we have seen the debacle in Afghanistan. We've seen the, uh, the catastrophic failure uh, of, of uh, the mission in regards to uh, how um, the mission has been, uh, has ended, how the pullout, the, the whole uh, mass hysteria that happened, uh, the extraordinary circumstances in which these people found themselves abandoned. And, and you know, the, the having lived a scenario like that in, in the wandering Kigali, uh, the, in the first 24 to 48 hours of the, the downing of the aircraft and the start of the genocide, uh, where thousands, thousands were screaming to be able to get on the planes and deciding which ones could and which ones could not. Um, and, and having seen them to fight their way through roadblocks where many were being slaughtered, just trying to get to the, to the airport. Uh, and they have no assets to be able to stop it because they had been, we had been abandoned, abandoned by the international community with statements like, you know, uh, there's there's nothing there in Rwanda. Why should we get involved? You know, it, 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 there's no resources. It's not worth it. And so on. It's not in our self-interest. There are risks. And, and the only thing that's there are human beings. And one country even said that, hey, there's too many of them. Anyways, it's overpopulated. The human being never, never met the criteria for intervening and trying to stop this catastrophic failure, which, which then brought me to, to, to not only feel and hear and smell and touch what was happening to those people in Afghanistan because of what I've experienced myself previously, but it made me reassess about what, what is there a pecking order in humanity? Has somebody sort of set up a, a, a sequence in which 
uh, the sub-Saharan black African is, is, is less human than, than others. Uh, uh, or is the, the white European more human than what they used to call the others? Um, and so it then profoundly brought about the debate of whether or not all humans are human. Is it possible, really, that some humans actually think they, they, it is a, a, a set of circumstances that might make some humans, yeah, more human than others? And I remember briefing uh, at a, um, a breakfast uh, in New York uh, to a number of UN uh, uh, ambassadors and so on, on exactly this argument of all humans being human. And I remember one major power, you know, uh, ambassador standing up and saying, no, not all humans are not equal. That wasn't was the question is whether or not they're human. And if they are human, then fundamentally there's equality. There may be nuances to it and so on and frictions, but they're all human. And so if that's the case, then where do we set ourselves as parameters in trying to meet the challenges you've been articulating? And I would argue that we can have an enormous amount of optimism for the future. And why? Because there is a generation that's coming into the world with a whole new set of tools, a whole new set of instruments that ultimately will be able to more than us grab the global sense of humanity. They're soon they'll be able to Skype all of humanity. They sense humanity. They sense human rights from a, a, a grander scale. And the, that generation without borders is going to be impatient with those who are putting these restrictions from sovereignty to, to self-interest as impediments of advancing and helping humanity. And in so doing, I think that impatience is going to turn them into activists. And if they really become these activists, with their extraordinary new tools of communication and so on, I think they will bring not revolutions, but certainly massive changes that will require other generations to reassess the fundamental premises that we use now, our political elites, to decide whether these humans are as human and as significant as these other humans. Thank you, sir. Um, I wanted to now uh, move into maybe just there are some really interesting questions coming in from the audience. And I would like to take this opportunity to merge a few of those questions that I think have similar themes. And I'm putting this out there for any one of you to be able to answer from your perspectives and your lived experience. But there are some interesting points about moral decision making, and especially in terms of military training and preparation. One question was about whether or not moral decision making is left to instinct. And if that is such that it's left to instinct, is that not a failure of military training at all levels? And uh, just to, to further that uh, point, you know, one of the participants also asked about the situation with Abu Ghraib and uh, certainly with, we know, um, many of the, the American forces that were present. Um, was that not an example of, you know, a failure of moral leadership, right? So can moral leadership actually be taught? So um, these are these are some of the themes coming through. And so I'd really love to hear remarks from any one of you um, in response to those points. Uh, I'm going to start if you don't sure. mind. And, and, uh, and uh, I hope my colleagues and uh, Patrick will mention, I, I do not believe that it is a failure of the military because part of that has been the education of the institutions that you're involved with and the human interfacing of that. So the, your workplace, your, your, your colleagues, the, the environment in which you find yourself, they do rub off and have, of course, inputs into you. But I think in regards specifically to the military side, there is something called an ethos. Uh, and an ethos is, is a guiding, uh, sort of a guiding atmosphere that is created 
uh, within the group, within the individuals who are part of the group, that gives them a compass, as uh, Michelle has indicated, and I like the term compass, and that ethos gives you parameters of values, parameters of moral references that yes, the organization is, uh, is uh, built on and that can reinforce and should reinforce uh, the expression of the society in which we're in. We are currently facing a real serious leadership deficiency in the Canadian uh, forces uh, because of a moral compass that was lost in regards to the abuse of women. And, and Patrick was raising it in operational theaters. But imagine that it's in, in garrison, in, in normal life, that, that senior officers have disconnected with, in fact, uh, the references of our society, that they've, they, they've actually fallen off, that their warrior ethic operational leadership simply doesn't seem to adjust to a, the, the normalcy of society and how you balance the normalcy of society with the profession you have, but also be prepared to uh, go into extreme scenarios like war and use the, the warrior ethic. I believe that there is uh, an institutional framework that will enhance that instinct uh, as part of your life experiences uh, to be able to take the right decisions. Thank you, sir. Uh, Patrick or Michelle, would you like to respond? Yeah, I would like to say words on that as well, because and I, I like the, the word moral compass, and and in, and I alluded already in in my first intervention, in, and you know one can call themselves lucky if you have got this moral compass from your upbringing, from your parents, as Michel said, from his father and my father as well. You know, we are lucky that we have that kind of compass inbuilt with us. Um, and second point is, yes, I think over the years, your instinct, your intuition is growing as well by falling down, standing up. Um, I, I took a number of decisions in many different circumstances purely on my instinct. And I walked out of the room when I said no to something. And I thought, why did you say no? And I had to argue with myself why did you say no? Because it was my instinct who said no. And in the end, I was right that I said no, because, you know, for all sorts of reasons. So, so yes, that instinct that grows over time. But the most important point is the example that we set for the younger generation, for the younger officers, from the, 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 the people that we lead. And I also, you know, you, you talked a little bit about sexual violence at Abu Ghraib, etc. It is beyond belief that anno 2021, Still, you know, you have a huge percentage of female uh, officers and NCOs, etc., female personnel in the United States Armed Forces who are sexually violated and assaulted, and the, and the victims cannot, you know, get the, the, their case made because it is blocked halfway, instead by their own leaders. And the political leaders in Congress, etc., have not addressed that properly. That is a lack of moral compass. And how can you then expect that those people who are violated sexually, you know, have trust in their commanders? That trust is broken, and that samples that, that 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 ripples through the whole, you know, organization because all people know and see that. That is really something that that is that is for me mind-boggling. But the example that people set, the example that you don't move your your embassy. Uh, 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 people with the Dutch passport from the embassy to the, to the Kabul airport first instead of having your people that you have to protect. Your local people, those people were the most vulnerable, they should go first. The, those eat first at the cafeteria, the officers eat last. That is what we have learned because not because we had that immediately from my instinct, no, I learned that from my instructors when I was a young officer. You had officers who le lectured yet that on that. And nowadays, you know, we have to go through scenario training so that we can, you know, bring reality as much as possible to the, to the forefront so that they can understand what it means to give the right example. And you, as the leader, as the divisional commander, as the force commander, you set the example. And, you know, of course, we fail also sometimes. 
we fail also sometimes because you know say you are tired or whatever but you have to learn from that as well say hey wait a minute you know i let those people down and you have to to to, to readdress yourself as well we are not uh, without failure but it comes from us with the stars and stripes first mm -hmm. if we don't do that you cannot expect from the leadership from uh, from your from your units uh, uh, anything but i give you one more example if i may sure i had in the congo a battalion uh, from a country and the, 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 the battalion commander and the two IC, the second in command, gave a lecture to the whole battalion, you should not do this, you should not do that, go to the girls and don't do the prostitutes, etc, etc, etc. The first one who climbed over the fence was the commanding officer. The second one was the, the second in command. And the battalion was in, 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 in shambles in a very short notice. So when I was made aware of this, um, I sent immediately the commanding officer and the, the second in command back home, and they were court-martialed back home. They gave me a new set. That battalion turned overnight, you know, because they, these two new ones, they led from the front, and no one dared to climb over the, over the fence to go to prostitutes or to the border. Absolutely. Like yeah. Amazing points that you are raising, um, Patrick. Um, from thinking about some of the challenges I know that we are having here in our own country on leadership within the military and the challenges that are um, related to female service members, but also uh, to thinking through our prioritization when we're in conflict zones, uh, whether or not our own population is deemed to be more important than the population we went there to serve. And from that perspective, Michelle, I would really love to hear your thoughts when you're hearing these points from the perspective of someone who is in a community that was being uh, or should have been served uh, by uh, military, um, police and, and eventually peacekeepers. And I know you still have family members in the DRC that uh, are facing many of the challenges uh, such as sexual violence. So if you wouldn't mind giving us some some thoughts. Yes, thank you, Shelley. Um, I think one of the uh, Patrick's really said a lot of the things that I really wanted to say. I think it comes really from trust. As a so on a on a sort of a macro picture, as countries, we we always talk about human rights. We talk about children's rights and the importance of these things. And you know, we get countries at the UN sitting down talking about this is what we do for human rights and this is what we do for children's rights. And then we have Guantanamo Bay. And then you have Abu Ghraib, as you said, and you already lose your moral company. You, you, you lose your moral position by contradicting the very things that you say you want to do. And as a society, we cannot do that. And I don't know why. So, so when I heard of Omar Carter, for, for example, to bring it to the Canadian perspective and how he was treated by the Canadian government left to rot in Guantanamo Bay. How can I, as a former child soldier, be able to look at the Canadian government and say that I can trust you? Because I myself don't, I would have been there had I been in the position as Omar Carter. And I think of these things time and time and time again, where we should not promise or we should not say things that we, that we, we are morally righteous when we can't do it ourselves. And so from, from the Congolese perspective, from my perspective as, as a young person, goes back to what I was saying the examples of the people that we put in positions of power. Who are they? What do they do? And are they honest? And honesty, humility, two of the greatest qualities that are, I think the most underrated qualities of great leaders is honesty and humility. Something that, again, Patrick really said, when you fail at something, not being able to hide it, say, I failed, own it. It makes you, it doesn't make you look weak. It just it puts you in a position of power because it shows people that you are human. And we need more leaders who seem to be human, not people who just regurgitate words because they think people want to, to hear those same things. Um, and it's incredibly, it's a difficult position, of course, to be in the world when I think so much of us, uh, we, are, we are so, so many leaders, I think, are married to power and are so they find it hard to de-entangle themselves from that from those positions but i think again the for me key words that really came out of it for me is again trust 
honesty and humility, uh, qualities of great leaders, and not just at an individual level, but at a country level. And I think that is so necessary, but also, of course, from organizational perspectives as well. Yes, absolutely, Michelle. Really beautifully said and just echo your points, especially on Omar Khadr's case. And as you know, um, we had uh, an evening with him and Ishmael Bey just before the pandemic got struck. And that is certainly something that Ishmael also stated as, you know, incredibly important um, for us to be true to our values at home as well as abroad. General Delaire, you're... Just, yes, sir, go ahead. A fast word, and thank you, if I may. Uh, you know, the, the, the there's the individual, of course, taking uh, and abusing and, and, and not, uh, in fact, uh, responding to the moral framework in which we expect them. But there's also the institutions that 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 sort of nearly accept that standard. And that is that, that will not intervene uh, to rectify a situation which then undermines the, the whole of the entity. Um, I remember in, in, in South Sudan uh, meeting with an ambassador where his the forces that were deployed there were uh, abusing uh, significantly um, the women there in Sierra Leone at the time and, and uh, the, uh, the uh, uh, young women in, in particular. And, and I said, you, you can't have that. that I mean, this is not uh, uh, acceptable uh, that this abuse be permitted. And, and his answer was, well, you know, they're away from home for a long time and boys will be boys. And that, that absolutely perverse argument uh, was in fact the reference that was used in, in establishing the standard of, of, of discipline and actions by uh, those forces in, in that country where uh, they were taking advantage of their position of authority and, and strength uh, on others and abusing. Uh, and that's why I never permitted fraternization in, in my mission and, and because you cannot abuse people who are disadvantaged. And lastly, the more and more and more that we, that with the male, the male dominated leadership and philosophy that exists in the world and the misogynist references that we use, is the more that that's going to be attrited by the presence, particularly through the millenniums of more and more women who are going to be able to influence, are going to be able to, to shake up how we act now and bring it to a standard that permits the genders and ultimately the acceptance of as equals of ethnicity and so on. The more that, that the women will come into the game of life outside and take positions of authority and reference, I think the better we'll have a balance uh, of the moral compass throughout the world and uh, the abuses of women will certainly, I hope, be reduced significantly. Thank you, sir. And thank you to each of our wonderful panelists today. There's so much to continue to discuss. I know that there are many questions still uh, that many of you have on the side panel. Um, unfortunately, due to the time restrictions and, of course, the various time zones that so many of you are in, uh, the, the session is now coming to an, an end. Uh, I would just like to um, end before I turn it back over to uh, Eric and Suzette for their closing remarks, is that, um, Michelle, you really made me think a little bit, too, about uh, humility and uh, forgiving and being willing to admit when one makes mistakes. It's one of the reasons why one of my greatest heroes is Nelson Mandela because of his humility and willingness to say he was wrong uh, when he made a decision. And he, um, just to, to end with a quote said, um, a leader is like a shepherd. He stays behind the flock, letting the most nimble go out ahead, whereupon the others follow, not realizing that all along, they are being directed from behind. So thank you very much, everyone. It was a great pleasure to be with you. And Eric and Suzette, I turn it over to you for your closing remarks. Thank you. Thank you, Shelley. Um, Suzette, that was a, a brilliant first session. Uh, what do you think? 
I think it was incredible to hear the to see the conversation and the dynamic that that uh, flowed from General Dallaire and also General Kamark and um, and and Michael. It was um, and Shelley, your your ideas that that helped weave things together. Certainly, some brilliant topics and and ideas that flowed like moral leadership grounded in trust, shaped by role models, informed and guided by one's moral compass that evolves together with one's ability to make, uh, as one's ability to make moral and ethical decisions evolves. These ideas about um, about trust um, and the centrality of leadership. Eric, Eric, what stood out for you? Yeah, I heard moral leadership. It's learned, it's modeled, it's shaped with an, with an ethos. The, the centrality of trust, relationship, uh, transparency, integrity, uh, characteristics of great leaders, trust, honesty, uh, humility and an individual and organizational as well as in a country level yeah I think I also you know the the central comment and question you know are all humans human what's our responsibility to to um, address that and to be true to values at home and abroad and the imperative of taking on a responsibility the the um, the imperative that each one of us has to to grow and evolve within ourselves um, and then to leverage and utilize those skills and that knowledge that we have to be able to make a true difference to transform um, cultures within whatever sphere of influence we may we may stand within. Mm -hmm. I, I agree, um, and and um, I think both of us we want to extend the gratitude and um, to to all the presenters today, the the rectors and, and the panelists, and 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 Shelley for setting the stage for this. I think I think great passion and wisdom. This is also engaged leadership. It is really what the critical conversations are about. And, and this is just a start. Um, thanks to you all presenters. Um, really, the, the, the words honesty and trust, expression of humility. And also I heard this, this call to action and, and hope for the generation without borders. Um, so, so please, to the, to the audience who is with us, uh, please, share your thoughts uh, in, in the box on the website. Thank you for your questions. We, we've seen a flurry of questions coming in and we've, we've been able to address a few. Uh, the box will be closed uh, at the session because that's only for the live stream, but there's an opportunity where you can share your thoughts and actions or comments that are still open. It'll stay open on the, on the website of the university. So, so on an end for this session, we, we do have seven more sessions planned. The next uh, uh, being on the 29th and the 30th um, of, um, of September. The 29th, we will focus on the cost of leadership and moral courage with um, former foreign um, minister, former foreign, foreign minister, uh, uh, foreign affairs, Barrett Kunders, the security strategist and gender advisor of on veteran uh, Deirdre Carberry and Ken Hofer, who served for 35 years in the Royal Canadian Armed Forces. And that is a, a session that will be moderated by uh, Dr. Alice Aiken, a veteran of the Canadian Armed Forces and uh, Vice President, uh, Research and Innovation of Dalhousie University. And then on and September 30th, we have um, the first National Day of Truth and Reconciliation in Canada, which will uh, begin our session with Elder Betty Latendre and, uh, and Shannon. Cornelson, who will highlight the importance of reflecting on residential schools. This will be followed by a critical conversation on ethical decision-making and moral dilemmas uh, with, with uh, General Dallaire and professor of law um, involved in the Rwandan War Crimes Tribunal, Robert Heinsch, retired general and former chief commanding officer of the Dutch Defense Force, Peter Van Um and Special Representative of the UN um, SG for Children in Armed Conflict, Virginia Gamba. Also will be joined by Cree lawyer and writer Delia Opikaku um, to see about her involvement in the residential schools and how that has, um, how her moral compass personally uh, has informed her professional um, service. The session will be moderated by Dr. Greg Zubach, um, who is, uh, who's, um, brings his expertise in the fields of law and, uh, and mediation. We'll see you then, and we thank you for watching. Eric, I wonder if you have any final, final concluding words. No, same share. I'll echo that, what you just said. Thank you very much for watching, and look forward to having you with us 
for the next couple of sessions. And thank you all presenters. Thank you. And thank you, General. Thank you. thank you very much. And well done, Shelley and Michelle and uh, Patrick and Eric and Suzette. Thank you. Well launched. Good stuff. What a pleasure. Thank you.